Hello one and all, and welcome to Behind the Glass, your weekly automotive podcast hosted by two rather uninformed enthusiasts. Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> I'm Sam from the YouTube channel Seen Through Glass. I'm Tony from Gravelwood Car Sales. And you can watch us each week on YouTube. You can also listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and most podcast players. We hope you enjoy the episode. How good is the GT3? Unbelievable. <laughs> so, essentially, we've both, in the last three to four days, been on road trips in our GT3s. Yep. You through Spain, me on the Podium Tours Rally to the Nürburgring. And we've spoken a bit on WhatsApp. We've been a bit overexcited and been like, oh my God, how good are these cars? I mean, we already knew. Anyway. We already, but I don't, I think I'd forgotten. Okay, fair. Because I knew, of course I knew how good that car is, but it's been a while since I've really driven a 992 GT3 in anger in the dry. Yeah. Because it was probably when I drove the press car, the Porsche GB press car in Wales and fell in love with that thing and text. She's like, I need one of these things. And, that, and that's another thing as well. You drove it in the wrong country. Well, no, Wales is good, mate. No, but the, the roads, they're not, it's not the same, mate. Like driving a car in Europe and driving them in the UK is not the same. Part, certain parts of Europe. Driving the cars in Spain, France, Switzerland. Yeah, fair. You know, so, uh, Portugal. All, Luxembourg, yeah, Germany. Yeah, yeah, Lots yeah. of parts, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to be fair. Most of Europe. Where in the UK, it's like the north of Wales is yeah. all right. Um, so you're, you're not wrong. But yeah, on my trip, it was the first time I've really pushed on in anger and the th- thing just it blew me away it blew me away and and you've been teasing me with the fact that you've also been having a good week so we're gonna dive into it i think like probably the majority of this episode which is coming to you from this random hotel room in spain is going to be about our gt3s but let's let's uh what was the word not evolve let's elongate that or let's spread that out by talking about both of our trips in general yeah go on because lots of interesting stuff happens so Coming to you first. Yeah, well, there's also a lot of interesting comparisons because you have a manual and I have a PDK. Absolutely. So Annoying that we aren't on the same trip. (laughs) Yeah, the same cars, but very different. They are different. Has yours got a cage? Of course, yeah. And what tyres are you on? Uh, I'm on the Goodyear's, which which I was actually, when I got the car, because I've only had the car three weeks, when I got the car, um, I thought, oh, I'm going to put Michelin's on. But actually, I can't tell the difference. Do you know which Goodyear? Well, they're the semi-slick one. No, no, but well, d- no you idea. don't know the name. No, no I don't. No. I'm not familiar with my Goodyear no. tire range. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, go Goodyear. I, it's not. Yeah. A, it's not a tire that you hear a lot about for the GT3. Yeah. Clearly, you've had a good time. Um, so yeah, tell us what what are the other cars on your rally and and give a bit more. I know you don't really know where you've been, but give us a rough idea of where you think you've been <laughs> over the last few days. So I can tell you where we started, and I can tell you where we are now, and I can tell you where we're finishing. Great, do that. So uh, we started um, kind of south of uh, Marbella. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just thinking which is south or north. Very near Gibraltar. About okay, twenty minutes from Gibraltar. Like down basically. towards Seville, like that far? Uh, no, not that no. far down. Okay. Not that, not okay. that far down. Um, in a hotel, um, in the middle of nowhere. Sure. And then we go literally at the hotel, straight on lovely roads. And I know that this is your thing with your road trips. You basically just do really nice roads. You avoid motorways like the plague, right? At, at all costs. Very, very rarely we we have to do a 15 or 20 minute drive on a motorway to get to the next bit but that's happened in the whole tour that's happened twice so yeah we've we've literally driven all the way here on mountain roads twisty passes yeah yeah i'm jealous that sounds amazing okay so yeah we're now in in lieda yeah which neither has been to before and is a little bit of a nondescript no i was here last year oh were you i've been here last year so when i said uh what do you think of lieda you're like where are we What's this place called? No, I stayed in this hotel last year. Okay, well, this is Lieda, Tony. Right, okay. Fine. Next time somebody says, where did you stay? You get Lieda. Right. And it is, I think it's just north of Barcelona. Yeah. So are you finishing in Barcelona? Where'd you finish? So we finish up in the hills <gasps> about two hours from Barcelona. So oh, wow. we're, we're going up a little bit. Well, that's uh, what I just did today. So that's probably where we're going. So I did that today, but not in the GT3 because I've switched cars since my road trip. I'm now in my 360 heading to Morocco. Yeah. Um, And because of the changes we did to that car, I spent most of today's drive going, oh, I wish I was in the GT3. 
Yeah. And the, the variations of roads that we've done. I mean, so what you've done today are probably all like twisty roads, aren't they? Proper, yeah, proper mountainish passes. Yeah, yeah so yeah, that's yeah, definitely yeah. what we're going to do tomorrow. Fine. But the variation of roads that we've done this week have been all sorts, mate, as okay. in big sweeping roads, um, twisty roads. Because there's not that... It's not like the, the Alps here. It's not like the French Alps. There's not many mountains. There are mountains, obviously, but there's not anywhere near as many as there are in the Alps. So there's a real selection of roads which is good because it's not the same roads all the time there's a real selection of roads and what always blows my mind about Spain is that there's no cars you don't see anyone you don't see no so one. much of the country is abandoned abandoned the roads are like carpets mm. like amazing no potholes lovely and smooth they always look new but actually, they're probably not new. Just no one drives on them. Yeah, they were probably done 20 years ago. But <laughs> yeah, you're, yeah, the, yeah. you're the first car to go on it. <laughs> yeah, literally. Um, so, hold on a sec. Uh, do you have a preference of road type? I know you said that the variation is what you like, but over the last five days with the GT3, have you got to it and gone, oh, actually, this is what I'm looking forward to the next sweepy section or the next twisty section? Yeah, so the GT3 in general is more suited to twisty stuff because of it's not a power car, it's a, it's a handling car, basically. And um, the twisty stuff, the, the other cars that are with me, they're more powerful, so... You know, they could sort of eat the road up a lot easier. So, for instance, like the Pista on on the on the big sweeping stuff is miles better than the GT3. Yeah, of course. No, yeah. I, I, and that I experienced too. Like the, the yeah, the GT3. Hey, look, it's not a slow car. No, no, no. Absolutely gets up and goes, and you can carry a lot of speed in that thing on big sweepers. And it straight won't let corners, go. Yeah, so yeah, straight yeah. Lines. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. yeah. Uh, fantastic, but yeah, where it really shines through. And I think what I was craving on my trip was yeah a twisty road where yeah. I can really just like attack the corners and, yeah. and cornering speed is what makes that car just come to life. Yeah, yeah. Even if you throw it in at what you think is 10 tenths, the car's like, <laughs> easy. Yeah. <laughs> it's the front end grip. It's got, it's got, um, obviously I've had all the GT cars and the front end grip on this 992 GT3 is like unbelievable. Unbelievable. It's better than the GT2. It's miles better. Than, and there's a GT2 on the trip. So ah, okay. we've had... Um, uh, 991 GT2 RS. 991 GT2 RS. Three uh, SF90s. Wow. Uh, and me. So, wow. Okay. Yeah. So I'm easily, on power, easily the slowest car. But, but definitely the most aggressive driver. Uh... <laughs> Oh, wow. If, if that's not an immediate yes, I'm quite terrified about your group. Yeah, we're all... Yeah, there's three or four of us that are all fairly aggressive. And the If other any of the so. others had come in a GT3, would they have been able to keep up the way that you have this week? Yeah. He's only saying that because we've got to have dinner with them all after this. <laughs> and he knows I'm going to absolutely <laughs> land in it. No. But that's quite, a, that's quite a big feat to, to mix with three SF90s and a GT2 RS in... A natural aspect of GT3, a car half the power, half the power. Yeah. Um, that's a that's a big task. I know in the real twisties, you're going to have an advantage over the SF90s at least in terms For of sure. weight and, and yeah. dynamics. But still, I mean, yeah, I mean it's it, and the twisty stuff. It's way better than the SF90s, um, and better than the GC2 RS as well. Really? It, yeah, yeah. Because those of you know GT3s, and you'll know this. You you can get on the power in a GT three halfway around the corner. Yeah, yeah it's like you li you literally tip the front in on the brakes and then literally stamp on the accelerator and it just drives around. Just and when on. I say stamp on the accelerator, I mean ping the accelerator. If you do that in a GT two, you're in a wall. Fair, okay. You yes. can't do that. You got to yeah. straighten the car. You got, back you got, up. got to, you got to wait. Same got to with patient. the SF ninety. Fair. So it's kind of the perfect poise of balance and handling and chassis and and I don't want to skip to my trip quite yet, but but that's what I found is that's what I had totally underestimated and and forgotten was that yeah you're kind of. I mean, the corners are just almost like a non-event. Like you just, as you say, you turn in and you pound and you're just gone. You're just yeah, gone. Like this it, is, and yeah. you really notice it more than ever when you're driving with other cars. More, more than, you're, you're absolutely right, yeah. It, it's rewarding when you're alone, absolutely. But when you're following what are other fast cars and my group, which we'll get into later, had a whole variety of everything from Civic Type R's right up to, to GT4's and uh, McLaren 600 LT's and Huracan Performantes. Yeah. But, I felt like 
I was just cornering at speeds way higher than but you, you any of been. those cars could yeah, have been yeah, able yeah. to do. Yeah, it was, it was nuts. It definitely, it, it's, I can't really think of a better car that goes around the corner that I've driven, even the, even the Pista, I can't think really of a better car that goes around the corner than the GT3. I still think the piece is a faster car. For sure it will be because of the power of the car. But, but to get the front end in, I, 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 road car I'm talking about, I'm not talking about racing car, I'm talking about road car. It is fantastic the way it, it, it turns. I mean, it sort of almost makes me think, God knows what the new 3 RS is going to be like if you ever got, I mean, if you ever wanted to drive it on the road. But yeah, yeah. yeah so for sure, it's been impressive. Has it? Has it been more impressive than you were expecting? Because you've been a bit on and off with 992 GT3. Don't forget, when it first came out, you were a bit like, I, like, I know what it's going to be. Like, I'm not that excited. Like, whatever. It's just a bit better than the last one. And that's true. For sure. But yeah, yeah, yeah. now having spent five days in it in Spain with your mates, are you now more enamoured by it than you thought you might have been? Um, yes and no. Because... It is doing what I expected it to do because that is what GT3s do. And I've been a little bit of a cheat because I drove one for a few hours out in Spain last year. Oh, yes. My, yeah, of course. My friend had one. So I had driven it in these conditions last year. So I I did sort of know what to expect. But when it's your own car, you push a bit harder and it's your car. You don't really care as much. So um, I'm not surprised how good it is. And I... I'm I'm glad it's as good as it is. It's like amazing. Have any of the other cars tempted you though? Have you, at any point have you looked and gone because SF90 we fell in love with the rear of them on the Mille Emilia, or we were intrigued by the rear of them because they kept flying past us. And 2RS obviously one of your halo cars. So have you spent the week at any point going? Oh, well, I've I've driven all I've driven them all. You so jumped in and out of all. Jump, of them. Jumped in and out of them all. Yeah, I drove the 2RS today for a period of time. I drove the there's a Spider SF90 and the Coupe, both okay. different by the way. Way. I would imagine so because yeah. Ferrari spiders famously have a bit of flex, don't they? They do, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So They're not like the McLaren tubs that are rock solid. They just yeah, tend to sort of yeah. float around, a bit. float around. Yeah. So I drove the SF90, and originally the roof was down, and I went around a corner, and I and I immediately pulled over and shut the roof. Yeah, you're because like, oh, I no. thought, oh no, yeah, no, yeah, no thank you, that. no, no. And then I drove the coupe yesterday, uh, and I spent a lot of time in the SF90. I've I spent nearly a day in the convertible and I spent a morning in the coupe. So I spent quite a lot of time in SF90. So I really got to grips with it. It is a mega thing, that car. You've always liked it. It is so far. Mm. Like, especially when you jump out of the GT3 and it's got no power at all. Although you don't need all that. You don't really need, for the road, you don't really need any more than 500 horsepower. But that SF90 takes the piss how fast it is. Yeah, it is a joke. A joke do you feel it, it though? Like, uh, do, when you're getting on it, do you look down and go, oh my God? Like, do you want, is it so fast that you actually don't realise how fast you're going? Well, that's like, exactly it's like Turbo what, S. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's exactly, yeah, it's like Turbo S on speed. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's exactly because Turbo happens. S to explain it uh, for at least my experience, nothing happens. You're like dawdling. And you look down, you're like, oh, it's 95 miles an hour. Yeah, or <laughs> like, more. Yeah yeah, 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 that's terrifying. Yeah. So uh, that's what the SF90 is like, is oh, it? Oh, mate, it's, it's like another... Uh, and you know the scary thing was, by the end of being in it, I'd almost got used to how fast yeah, it was. scary. Which is scary because I was driving it like flat out. So you like, you end up driving like a complete nutter, do you? <laughs> Just well, to, get some, to get some, to get some. Yeah. When well, no, I know, <laughs> you drive like a nut in a fiesta. But, but, but what I mean is like safely. It, by the way, it pushes you on to yeah extract that speed so that you get some sensation. You don't want because you could beat almost everything in your field, or at least on my tour, driving that car at five tenths or four tenths. You yeah. would still beat everything. Yeah. But obviously, that's not rewarding for you as a driver. You're not getting the feeling, the emotion, mm. the connection. So you've got to drive it hard to bond and at which point mucho rapido you know you know what I always like is driving all these different cars I, they all drive differently mm -hmm. they've all got different different characteristics you have to drive them all differently some of them you brake earlier some of them you brake later some of them you trail the brakes sometimes you get on the power early there's loads of different ways you drive all these different cars and I love that figuring out well, actually, I can't do that in that car because I'm going to crash. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Hopefully you figure that out pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah, I figured it out before. Yeah. But 
and I can do that in that car. And then the 2RS again was completely different. Like, you can't drive the 2RS. It's very similar in the way it behaves to the 3. Obviously, it's rear engine. Um, it's a Loads Porsche. of grip, downfalls. Um, and you can, you can genuinely, in the GT cars, you can genuinely feel the downfalls in the car. In the More s- than the SF90, by the way. Fair. SF90 has that active spoiler, right? It does, weird yeah. Weird lip, but yeah, those big wings, when you're pushing on, I think important to clarify, because we're often the first to say like, downfalls on the road means nothing. Like, it's nothing. <laughs> Depending on how I, fast you go. Yeah, I think that's all we'll have <laughs> but, to say. But we can't really talk about it. We, as I was saying, like, <laughs> we'll respectfully allow you to make your own conclusions about yeah. the week that Tony's had in those two cars. Um, but yeah, at speed, the downforce is noticeable. That's yeah. what we will say that. But, but also what I will say is as well... <laughs> HR department, just looking to that <laughs> one. <laughs> the, the GT3 at speed feels more planted than even the 2RS. Really? It does, yeah. You think that's a generational thing? I or? don't know. I, I, really, I really don't know. They, they f- although they are similar, they are very, very different in the way they mm, behave. Mm. Like, you'd expect the 2RS to be stupidly fast in a straight line, and it is, of course. And it absolutely eats the ground up. And if the GT3 is in front or behind, the bit that I have, because I was following the GT2 most of the week, and the bit that, I couldn't live with was when it finally got its power down and punted out the corner. Okay. I mean, it would just drive away yeah. from the GT. So you're like right on its bumper the whole way through the corner, then it, it gets straight and it's gone. Well, what would happen was I'd have to hang back a bit because as I go into the corner and out, I'm faster Yeah, yeah okay. because I'm on the power way before the 2RS. The 2RS can't really get on the power until it's half straight, or at least it can see that it can get on the power. So we're coming out of these hairpins and he's got to wait, 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 then go. Whereas the, the, the free, I'm halfway around. Like I said, I'm, I'm already flat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've got to wait a bit. So the bit that he gains on the straights, I'm breaking that. I carry more speed in. I'm on the power. So then I'm right up behind him again. So it's like cat and mouse. That's what it was like all the time. But the real big sweeping corners, the real big fast corners, he would just edge away from me. Not because of the corners, because we'd probably go in corners same speed. It's just the power of it. It's 200 yeah. horsepower more. Yeah, yeah. It, he would just edge away. You know, when I, when we used to speak about 992 GT3, and then obviously when I announced I was getting one, a lot of people were like, it's just a lot of hype around that car. Like, what's the big deal? Like, I don't get it. Like, what... It really is, and I think I proved it to my group, and I proved it to myself, and it sounds like you proved it to your group and yourself, just the most unbelievable fast road car. That, where the, the lads that I'm with, they're all petrol heads, and they've all had more, even more cars than me, all of them. They've all, you, you, I can't tell you how many cars they've all had. And we all come to the conclusion this week, because they've all driven the, the GT3 as well, that for the money, there's nothing better. Well, this is the thing, right? So let's switch a little bit to my trip, I suppose. Um, my car, yeah, we, I was a variety of things on, on, the, on, on our trip. 25 cars, everything from an old V8 Vantage, Civic Type R, modified Clio, up to, yes, Huracan Purple Mante, 600LT, 570 GT, Challenge Stradale, you know, a, a real, real range. Yeah. And arguably, most people agreed that the Purple Mante, the 600 LT and the GT3 were the kind of top three performance or supercars on, on the trip. They would right? have been for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So unfortunately, actually, I drove with the Purple Mante quite a bit. I never got to drive with the LT. Guess why? Broke down. Every time we left somewhere, it had an issue. Yeah. Bless them. They were the nicest guys in the world. And he'd only bought the car fairly recently. And he had an absolute blast and loved it. But it just had... Similar to my 540, he had all those annoying glitches. Yeah. Windows not going down, doors not yeah. opening. So anyway, let's not get into it because we don't want this. Which to be McLaren. fair, no, no, no. But to be fair, I, I, I've spent a lot of time with, not driven, not, I have driven a 600 LT, but I've spent a lot of time on trips over the years with 600 LTs. And the 600 LT has been the most reliable. They tend to be fantastic. It's the yeah. one that I actually recommend to people. People often message me saying, is it worth getting a McLaren? I say, stretch the 600 LT because I've yeah. heard they're bulletproof. Yeah. So it's quite shocking actually. But uh, price-wise, help me. Where's a Performante these days, Vat, price-wise? Well, 
Um, with some miles on, they're probably anything between 180 and 200. I'd so think. on a used market, those three cars are all similar money, right? The, the LT is the cheapest, probably 130, 140. 140 yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sort of, I think they've come on strong. But yeah. Okay, fine. So yeah, really hard to, to figure out. But essentially, um, you know, that's an older car. Performance is an older car. I, you know, I'm in a 2023 nearly, 992 yeah. GT3. Um, and, and yeah, we all just sat back and went, actually, to do what that car can do or has done on this trip, you actually need to be spending a hundred grand more because the Performante and the LT were definitely in that realm, but older. So if you want new, so if you want the Huracan Technica or if you want the Artura or if you want the whatever, you're actually spending a hundred grand more than that. You're at the 250 mark rather than the 150 at mark, least, which is mate. obviously my car list. At least, so, yeah. um, I think that's where the GT3 is quite amazing because it does punch in its ability at that level above. But they have always done that, by the way. Always have they? They've always, um, you know, my previous generation GT3s, they've always punched above their weight. It's why they're so in demand because they don't make enough of them and demand is through the roof for them, which is why they always hold their money because they do punch well above their weight for what they are. You know, like you comfortably keep up with, you know, supercars with 100, 200 horsepower more, literally just because of the way they are. Yeah. So I do have a little bit of a confession to make, or actually there's something to discuss. It's not a confession at all. So I set that up really wrongly. You're now going to absolutely it, come at me. It is a confession. It, it's not a confession. So the only thing which I... Oh, how do I phrase this so that you don't eat me up? <laughs> I know what he's going to say as well, by the way, ladies and gentlemen. Obviously, you touched on it. The difference between our two cars, yours PDK, mine's manual. Uh -huh. So I absolutely still love the manual. Yeah. I don't regret the decision at all. Good. And for the 99.9% .9 situations on my trip, it was the dream. I was loving it. The yep. engagement was fantastic. But perfect. I was on a rally and 25 cars. It means you get on the motorway. Everyone gives it large joining the motorway. Gets up to speed real quick. Mm. Every time I was joining the motorway, I was already just cruising. I'm cruising, you know. I'm in sixth gear coming off the roundabout. And then I'm like, oh. Doof, 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 doof. Bah! Yeah. Like, the amount of times I was caught out yeah. because, or people on the motorway go, oh, let's drop down to 30 and do a side-by-side -side up yeah. to 70. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or in Europe, it's up to 80. Good for yeah. So... And I was just like, I can't be asked. So I kept like, I think people got a bit annoyed by me because yeah. everyone wanted to like, let's drag. But and to your like, to your defence, I mean, we we don't really do that anyway. No, no, no. But There's a big rally. Like you know, people were overexcited on the first day. Fair. I get it. Like, but to your your defence, why why would you want to straight line a GT3? Because it's not fast enough. Straight. It's not. It's not what it's for. And it annoys me the GT3 in a straight. It's a bit like when I had the Speciali. You can't shut the bloody thing up yeah, yeah. do you know yeah. what I mean it cruises just, at 4000 RPM just revving its nuts it's off really, like, it's, it's like, so aggressive it's like, so yeah. annoying yeah yeah because yeah. in Europe as I say most motorways are 80 85 something yeah, like yeah, that yeah. miles an hour compared to the UK 70 yeah. and that really is like four, four and a half thousand RPM yeah. and, and it's singing at that point at GT3 yeah. and you're Marrr! literally like, yeah. okay yeah. Um, but it's you know it's all worth it for, for a million other reasons but yeah. but yeah so so that just uh, as I say, in those occasions, in really real life um, uh, situation, there's like, okay, fine, you've got to go for a sudden overtake or you've got to suddenly react. But that's the same with all manual cars. Yeah. But I just think that that's the thing with the GT3 is that really the power band is really five, 6,000 RPM. It is, yeah. It? Five, and five and a bit when the power really starts to come in, yeah. It's kind of where you want to be. And when you're on the twisties, you end up just sticking in like second and third gear just to just give it all the welly, don't yeah. you? Just to, just to make sure that you've got that maximum power. The thing, the thing for me, I mean, I absolutely no way... I wouldn't buy a manual because of one, because of the way I drive and what I always drive with. Of course, I don't use my cars in the UK. I don't do what you do. I don't travel on my own. I go with a group of pals. It's a trip car. And then it goes back and I either sell it or I keep it for the next trip. So I, I could not have a manual for that reason. Cause it's hard enough as it is trying to keep up yeah, with, yeah, with yeah. a car, double the power and about having to change gear. And actually I'll use the PDK to slow the car down 
obviously I used to go down the gears and slow the car down of as well. course and obviously short shifting out of corners and stuff it's a pain in the ass in the manual. You, yeah you, you you have more abilities to play with the engine and the power yeah but I think I gain massively as I say in terms of engagement and reward on the twisties but also on the slower stuff and the memories like burned into my cordon and my brain of some of the roads through Luxembourg that we drove yeah some of the, through the Black Frost towards the Nürburgring like it's just like like I yeah. just absolutely was like this car is the bomb and you know funnily enough we talked about it a bit I think kind of off air and at least with Paul that you know since since I drove that car to Austria I haven't really touched it and I've been a little bit like like I'm a bit not worried but thinking is that car just going to end up being like the special occasion car which I already got that I've got the mm. 360 and I was just a bit nervous but oh my god after the three days Change your mind again. Oh, I'm obsessed it's, I'm, it's the best car in the world <laughs> yeah, I was like yeah. I want to put back seats in it and keep it as the family car this yeah, thing is just yeah. unbelievable um, yeah. but we have to talk about my final destination of my trip which was the Nürburgring mm. so, go around I went around with it. <laughs> I, I actually, in the lead up to it, I wasn't sure if I had the balls to do so. Okay. I don't like the Nürburgring. Okay. Not because of the ring itself, but because of the other people. I'm people sure we've it. touched on yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've it, done it many times and it's terrifying, especially if you've never done it before. It is terrifying, the Nürburgring. It's the unpredictability of the other people, yep. especially on a tortoise there. I'm not going to say the German one, a tortoise, but I'll Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, where you get literally everyone from someone in their polo of con- VW Mark III convertible going around at 40 miles an hour yeah. to absolutely kitted out 1980s 318Is just flat. Like yeah. it's so, so overwhelming. And on top of that, you then got to remember the track and where to go. It's impossible and- to remember it. So I was a little bit like, oh, I don't I like I, I kind of have to go. Like if we're going to the Nürburgring, I've got a GT3. Like I kind of have to do a lap. Like how bad can it be? But then I was just like pooping myself thinking I'll look for any excuse to not do it. <laughs> and I thought I'd found an excuse because on the Saturday, which we got to the Nürburgring on the Sunday, on the Saturday, I was following one of the cars on the rally and we went through this, or went down this super, super stone ridden road. And as I'm following, it was a Supra. I just see this rock line of and smacks onto the left hand side of my windscreen massive crack really instantly. straight away massive crack and i was like oh and as i'm going oh i see another rock on the right hand side another massive crack wow both sides i was like oh my god and at the time i was like oh you know crack windscreen not the end of the world I woke up the next day being like, oh, it's just a nightmare. Like, I bet you if I call Porsche, they're going to be like, oh, so it's six months for a new windscreen. Like, I'm so sorry, production delays, whatever. Like, I just thought this is just a massive headache. But I, the silver lining was, maybe I don't have to go around the ring anymore. <laughs> I was like, maybe I can just say, oh, sorry, guys. A damaged car, can't go around the ring. Like, <laughs> I got a crack windscreen. Came all this way. I can yeah. still do the YouTube title of taking my GT3 to the Nürburgring, ring, just not driving around it. <laughs> um, but... As we made our way there and as we arrived, I was like, no, it, it, it should be done. And, and it was a big, uh, the Green Hell driving days, it was a special weekend where basically all three days, Nürburgring was open for right. tourists. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it was heaving, mate. Yeah. Like, heaving. And beautiful sunshine, blue skies. Saw, it's a cool place. I like going there. Oh, mate. It's yeah, the it's cool, coolest place. Yeah. Like, a lot of the people on the Podium Tours Rally hadn't been. Yeah. So... We were sitting in the traffic to go up to the, you know, Devil's Diner and the start. Yeah, yeah. And I said, this, let's just bail. Let's just go to the, the Grand Prix circuit straight and get some food. And we parked up and sat down at a diner, or not a diner, a restaurant, sat outside and just car spot yeah. for like two hours. Yeah. And everyone yeah. was like, this place is amazing. Yeah. Saw a handful of 992 GT3 RSs. Did you? Yeah. Going round? Uh, yeah, a few of them going round. Yeah. Uh, I saw a yellow one on the road and I saw a silver one on the track and a... Another one on the track, can't remember the spec of the other one. But, they literally um, look like a racing car, don't they? Yeah, look insane. Yeah, yeah, insane. Yeah. But what was mad, there was, there was also racing cars going around, so pretty hardcore. But yeah, so I uh, so saw a lot of the GC3 hours. So they, it's a it's a lot. Yeah. Like, it's a lot. We saw a black one at Spa as well, because we stopped off for the WEC at Spa. Let's talk, let's let's earmark that and come back to that yeah, in a okay. second. But um, yeah, it's, it's an aggressive looking car. But yeah, so many other cars there. Uh, MG GT Black Series, MG GT3, like the actual race car was going around. Um, everything you can imagine. But yeah, geared myself up and got hold of Misha. Yeah, fair. YouTube 
Nürburgring King. Because uh, uh, he took me around for the first time I ever went around. He came on my passenger seat in the mm-hmm. Carrera T and coached me around. And I actually loved the experience. He did it like a rally driver. Break here, turn in, off the brakes, left, aim for this board, move to that board, come to the centre. Like, And I just zoned out and I just listened to every word he said. And we got around the lap and I actually kind of enjoyed it. Enjoyed so it. Lovely. I thought, I kind of want him back. So I sent him a message. He said, yeah, of course, no problem at all. And I said, look, it's so busy. I'm really freaked out. And this car's way more powerful, way more capable than Lars. So just please just do the same thing. Um, but just don't, like, if you know it's like flat, flat with you behind the wheel, tell me to like do a slight lift. Yeah, like, yeah. I don't want to be flat, flat, yeah, flat. Like, yeah, like, I just yeah. want to make it around and have a nice time. Yeah. So he was like, okay, no problem. I'll just tell you where to break. And I was like, yeah, fair. So off we went, a busy old day. And you can see actually, when you watch the footage back, my confidence gaining throughout the lap. Yeah, it will. Yeah, I'm yeah. very steady at the beginning and he reminds me that I'm on cold tyres, which I remember when I go through a corner and, whoop, and I'm like, okay. Um, but by God, that car is fantastic. Uh, however, I was slightly shown up when I came up behind a rather fast moving Suzuki Swift. <laughs> I mean, that is a little bit of a joke. Oh my God. And I think it was kitted out, but I don't even know because on the footage, it's like rent me. It's like a rent a car. Yeah, it's probably a renting car. Yeah. Honestly. And the thing was moving. And Misha's like, okay, overtake the Swift. And I'm like, ah! And he's like, okay, over- you can overtake the Swift. I'm like, I think I'm good. Like yeah. he was going at enough of a pace, or she was going at enough of a pace that I was like, I'm happy just to sit back here. I'll just follow it. Like, yeah, yeah. Three or four corners later, we caught him on the brakes and I was like, okay, right, just lunge. But my God, the stuff that's going really fast is the stuff you don't expect at the Nürburgring. Mm. I got done by this murdered out one series that like hatchback that, I mean, literally you would think it'd be dealing drugs on an estate in the UK. Yeah. Came flying past, like was bouncing through the corner in front of me. And I was like, oh my, what are you doing? Yeah. What are you doing? Yeah. Um, but yeah, the GT3 was was absolutely mind-boggling. Uh, first time I've ever put the car in track mode. Right. So I had it fully, you know, everything turned up, suspension on full whack, bumpy through the carousel. It was very be, bumpy, yeah. Gotta be honest. Yeah. Um, and another time when, because I didn't know where I was going, I had so much to uh, negotiate in terms of traffic, and I was trying to consume all the information Misha was telling me. Definitely missed a few gears. Like, definitely, like, downshifts, which is again, the manual PDK thing. I of think if course. I- If, if you're I, going on track, you've got to have a PDK. Well, if I'd known sure. where I was going, I would have been all over it. But listening to what he's saying, which is literally bullet, like, what's called bullet time? No. Anyway, like rapid fire, there we go. Rapid fire rally driver notes whilst also negotiating traffic. And then not thinking, oh wait, I'm in fifth, I should be in third. Yeah, like, yeah. Well, obviously if you're on a PDK, it's just, it's a bit- Yeah, yeah. More yeah. natural, I suppose. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, I'm not looking to go back. Got to be honest. Didn't, no, fair enough. Didn't finish my lap and go, God, can't wait for the next one. Yeah. The thing that I, when I first went to Nürburgring, I was absolutely terrified. I'd, I'd, I'd done loads of track, even back then I'd already done loads of track driving. I was terrified of going around there. And then I figured out after a few laps that actually the faster you go, the easier it is. One, that's why I wanted Misha with me. Yeah. Because it was so busy I was like, I don't want to spend my whole lap just looking in the mirrors and terrified. Yeah. And and that's exactly it. We were going at enough of a pace that we were moving through the traffic. Yeah. And there were a few fast people that came up behind us, but they were easy enough to let go yeah. and maintain our pace. E- where if I was alone, I would have just like sc- scooted around. At so the far fa- like. the fast people the fast people normally are the taxis, the ring taxis. Yeah. And the local lads that are in the fast cars, the Porsches, the Mercs and stuff like that. They'll always come past you because they're too fast. But actually, you're never in their way because they're so fast. They know every inch of the track. Yeah, They'll I had a just Clio come past Cup it. car that just, just for, I didn't have to do anything. Yeah, yeah, there, yeah. Like. But if you if you knew the track properly, you'd be going past him. It's, yeah. Nürburgring is all about knowledge. So if you know the track, you can you can go around really fast in a golf. Do you know what I mean? A normal, a well, that, normal that, I golf. mean, as I said, like the one series that flew past me, like exactly. My God, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that that doesn't mean he'd be any good at any good on a track. He just knows the Nurburgring. It's like you're going home every night and you know every inch of the the road that you go home in every night. It's the same thing. The Nurbur- the only the thing which really catches Nurburgring out is that the speed that you're going. Yes, people forget how fast. Like I don't know how fast you were going, but as you come out the pits, and I've seen it a few times, and I've done. And enough like I don't I still don't I know where it goes but I still don't like I'm not like Misha like he's done thousands of laps around there but I've seen it before like people come out the pits they go down the hill 
round the left, forget they've got cold tyres, and either go straight or they go in the barrier. Yeah, well, we saw someone go straight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's because it's because the tyres are cold. But what you forget is if if you're in a fast car, you're doing 150 mile an hour. Then. Yeah, yeah. You forget I mean, how fast you're going. That's exactly it. I mean, I don't think we did any ludicrous speeds from my camera. I think, like, we were topping out, like... 205, 210 kilometers and I was backing out. Like, yeah. I didn't want to be going yeah. too much faster than that. But there were plenty of sections where he's going like, go, 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 speed's good, speed's good. And I'm still like coming off it because I'm like, this is ridiculous. And that's the other thing as well is when you know it, you know the ability of the car as well. That's the other thing where Misha's had so much experience in so many different cars. He can jump in the passenger seat and know what the car's capable yeah. of. Is that there were corners when I would have braked and shifted down two gears and he's like, keep going. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Just keep going. Like, it, yeah, it, yeah. It, you know, it's all about yeah, as you say, ri riding the the riding the ring. Yeah. Um, and and it is as you say, learning a, a great road. I, hey, look, it's fun. It's a roller coaster. I I always think you should all ex everyone should experience it. Yeah. But it's an intimidating and terrifying place, and especially in a car that well, the bank lent you lots of money to buy. <laughs> um, but no, all in all, I came away from my trip just going. I think that car is unbelievable. I wouldn't even know how or how to replace it. I wouldn't change the thing. I know I've gone in on the manual a couple of times here, which now everyone's going to be saying, ah, I should have got PDK, but I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. I'm yeah, just because, highlighting like a few things. I yeah, don't want to change a thing. Yeah, fair, because it was only, it was only highlighted because of what you were doing that particular weekend. Like you said, 99% of the chant time, time. The, the manual is, suits you completely fine suits because, me perfectly, of, because yeah, of what yeah. you do. Whereas me, it's the complete opposite. Yeah. I could not be in a manual at all. Yeah, yeah. No, no, fair. I'd, I'd, I'd have to be in a PDK. You have to be in a PDK. Yeah. Well, I can't wait to get back in the car. It is now sitting in the south of France, waiting for the next uh, leg of its adventure uh, with a cracked windscreen. So I'm really hoping that- How many miles has it done now? Uh, good question. I guess 6,000 odd kilometers. Is that 4,000 miles? Not quite. Three and a half thousand miles. Like oh, car, I'll, be, I'll be very close to you. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I'm at- Fair. 2,600. Yeah. Got yeah, another we, couple of hundred miles to go. Yeah, can't, yeah, can't be too far off. Um, but I'm in desperate need of a new windscreen. So I'm, yeah, so I'm hoping poor... Centre Porsche Antibes answer my call because it's Thursday today and I've been calling them since Monday. They're not a lot so, of money. Well, they're not hard workers in Porsche Centre Antibes, I'll tell you that. Oh. It's about supply is my concern. Oh, fair. I'm worried they're going to say it's hard to get hold of one. No, but I think it's a normal 911 screen, mate. Oh, wait, hold yeah, on a sec. One big thing which we didn't talk about, which I put on my stories, which I really wanted to discuss, oil. Have you had to top up the oil? Not yet. You're going to get a warning any second now. I know, because- Find I, some oil. No, 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 but it's, it's fine. Have uh, you got some? I've got some in the car, well yeah. Done, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was my big mistake. So Russell from Porsche Guildford gave me oil when I collected the car and said, it's worth having this in. These GT3s drink oil. They do. And at some point, I was having to load the boat, boot with loads of stuff and I took it out and I forgot to put it back in. Yeah, they do use oil, yeah. So on the way down from the Nürburgring to the south of France where I was dumping the car in storage before I did the 360 venture and then go back and find it, I get this low oil warning and not only am I in the middle of nowhere, I was like somewhere between Lyon and Cannes. Um, it was a bank holiday in France. It was 6 p.m. UK time. So no one in the UK was like, like I just had no one that I could call, nothing yeah. that I could do. It's and only was, asking you to top it up, mate. It will need like half a litre or it something. It says li one litre max. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's the 0W40, which at f in French service stations, impossible to find. Yeah. I know that I, I wanted to get into it because- you could uh, probably put 540 in though. Well, yeah. So I asked the question, look, can I put anything else in? Yeah. Or like, how far can I go? Because yeah. as you say, like, it's only a little top up. It's the, it's the sort of, uh, the extra one litre at the top. I think somebody said the gearbox holds like five litres of oil. <laughs> the the car will hold like nine or 10 litres of oil. So it, it's just, it's just, it, you wouldn't kill, kill the car. So basically. that's the sort of first thing. Um, but also, yeah. What are your opportunities? Because, according to forums, but also I think Porsche dealers, it's like, it has to be mobile one and it has to be zero, zero W40. Okay. So on the onboard, because I really went into this, on the onboard manual in the GT3, it says, yes, Porsche recommends mobile one. So I immediately read that as you can put any different make you yeah, want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can, because I've done it before myself. And in the manual, it says recommends zero W40, but on the actual oil filler cap, it has a big exclamation mark saying, has to be zero W40. Right. Now, I am, this is not an area of my knowledge. So the zero or the number at the start is to do with temperature, right? It's the the temperature that it can operate at. So the lower the number, 
the bigger the range or the bigger the cold temperature range that it can operate out. So zero yeah, still is like, it being thick and thin. Exactly. Basically, yeah. Uh, and then the the forty is the more important part. So yeah. yes, theoretically, you should be able to put a five W forty. Probably not a ten W forty, but a five W forty. Um, a few other people were saying you could put a zero fifty or zero. Th- anyway, because it'll op- it'll operate better in hot conditions, basically. Um, I just have to say we are sitting by a big window, and uh, one of your SF ninety lads drove past. It's a yeah, good, it's a good looking car. Because I will tell you why. Oh, why? Because when we pulled up, he was too lazy to take it round to the car park. So he just abandoned it just outside. It. So now he's obviously been asked to move it. He's been for a spa, ladies and gentlemen. He's just dumped his SF90. And now he's been told to move it. He's now got to move it's it. It's the SF90 life. But uh, anyway, so yeah, back to oil. So yeah, people were sort of, I had so many mixed messaging about this. Um, the other really important thing is in the manual, it says Porsche approved oil can be mixed. Because a lot of people were saying you have to have Mobile One and it has to be 0W40. Don't put anything else in. It's super dangerous. People were saying stop driving the car immediately, oh. like blah, blah, blah. But also in the manual, it says if it's an orange or yellow light, just top up when you next can. Correct. If it's a red light, pull over safely. If it's a red light, then it's really low. Then you're really low. You're in trouble. So anyway, luckily, long story short, I managed to find some oil and figure it all out and it was fine. But it just opened up this can of worms of... What are you supposed to do in that situation? Go against advice of the manufacturer. And also, these GT3s just tend to be, or seem to be, extremely thirsty when it comes to oil. They're, yeah, because they're a performance engine. It's a, it's a cup car engine, mate. So it, it's a performance engine. So they do use oil. They, all, they always have done. All the GT cars okay. I've had. But equally as well, I've had that situation before and I've put the next best thing oil in. Because there's only a top up. Oil, at some point, oil's oil. Well, you can always oil do, is oil, yeah. You can do an oil change, right? You're only topping it up, mate. And is that just a bit of manufacturer sort of pressure of, I'd say it says recommend, and obviously Porsche themselves are going to say, oh, yeah, it must be Mobile One. But You know, the way I always look at it is as well, is people get these performance cars and they say, I've only ever put 98 run in. Never put any other fuel in but 98. Well, let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. I only ever put 95 in my cars because sometimes in Europe that's all you can get yeah on the twi- on the smaller roads when you're up in the hills or the mountains that's all you can get you can- so it makes absolutely no difference is that well, it's, it's an extra gives you an extra two horsepower there's a power difference I didn't notice it better for the life and the longevity of the engine okay but I'm not going to have it in 25 years time so <laughs> you don't care it's bottom um, for the next I'm day. sorry about that yeah. that's so aggressive yeah I mean yeah it's a bit of a weird one I, I was getting a little bit Aggie, uh, a lot of the comments who was, you know, really like, this is how it is, because I feel like maybe we've all been conned. Like, I, I just don't, be- I-, I feel like it's a sort of clever, mar- I mean, that's exactly what I, it's I think it's marketing. And- I genuinely believe that 98 fuel and 95 fuel is marketing. But what about oil? Because I don't know uh, it's, a, it's a motorsport engine, you're right. It's Correct. a highly tuned, p- specific motorsport Correct. engine. Like, the last thing I want to do is mess it up by putting completely the wrong oil in and then find out that I've broken the engine. But and, I, and I'm sure you would if you constantly put the wrong oil in it all the time, but you're only topping it up. It's a maximum one litre top up. Maximum. To get you, or w- w- at the time, from, I say lucky I found the right oil, but at the time it would have been another 100 kilometres yeah. down the road so that then I could get it to a Porsche centre yeah. where I could do an oil change. If you really wanted to, yeah. So I think in those situations, you know, when it's low, just, just, put something in and don't be so scared about what Correct. the, the label oh, we say that maybe we'll have, <laughs> I'll have a blown up GT3 engine no, at some won't. point but I, but now I've known that now I know how hard it is I'm just going to stockpile the stuff yeah um, but you just uh, need a litre of oil in there I just need a litre of oil yeah literally I ended up having to find you know you can on the menu you can check to see the level yeah yeah I know I know yeah, but yeah. I didn't I didn't know that it was an issue I, I should have remembered I wasn't thinking right and obviously, you know, done up to 6,000 6, kilometres, I should have thought oh, the oil was going to go at some point. Yeah. And actually, the Purple Manti had a low, a low oil one, and yeah, that should yeah. have triggered my memory, but I just yep. didn't really think about it. Um, Ferrari engines are very good on oil, by the way. Oh, yeah? Don't use them, yeah. Oh. I've never, ever, ever, all the Ferraris I've had, never had to put oil in them. I've never put oil in the 360, to be honest. There you go. Yeah. Um, well the, done, Ferrari. I had to find out the way I found the Zero W40 then was like some backwards industrial estate and it was like a it wasn't even a shop front it was like a mass part I typed into Google like oil for sale and it was like a distributor wow and I went and I paid him cash 
Fair. Just for one thing. Good Lovely. Um, Jean Pierre, he's called. Uh, how cliched. Was it really Jean Pierre? Yeah, Jean Pierre. Because <laughs> he gave me his card because he got like clock, obviously, like. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I touched on it. Let's circle back. WEC at Spa. Amazing. So, this was my first chance to see the new era of hypercar mm-hmm. racing uh, Porsche, Ferrari. The racing? Mate, racing the six hours. Wow. So, we got there. Now, I don't know about you, but whenever I arrive at a racetrack... Love it. Mate, for a race weekend. Yeah. Because in advance, I was like, yeah, it'd be cool to see the hypercars, but I wasn't like buzzing. But then arriving at Spa, all the traffic, I could hear the cars. I was like, oh! But mate, it was five degrees, six degrees max, and raining. Crash. At the start of the race. Crash? Mate, all the crashes. Yeah. All the crashes. So we positioned ourselves at the end of the Kemmel Strait. So the top of Eau Rouge, yeah, Kemmel yeah. Strait, and then yeah, Lacombe, the yeah, first yeah. Yeah, yeah. chicanes. I was like, this is a bigger place to w- watch the start. So I don't know, and I have to familiarise myself, because I watch Le Mans, but I don't really watch much more of the WEC or any, any other endurance races, really. Mm-hmm. And I haven't watched a lot this season, so I, I don't know. But they seem to do endless formation laps, maybe because of the temperatures, or just that's how it works. It's a rolling start. Yeah, it's it? always rolling start, yeah. So the first formation lap... The Toyota, I think, was in pole. Was it the Toyota? Yeah, Toyota's in pole. Go straight. At the at the Lacoon, just go straight. Really? On the formation lap. And I was like, oh, we're in for some fun here. <laughs> Mate, every third or fourth car, straight into the gravel, spinning, going wide. I was really? like, this is chaos. And yeah. those new era hypercars coming out of Lacoon. Really? And trying to find grip and seeing these things squirm. I, I know you love a racing driver. I was suddenly like, oh my God, <laughs> you are the coolest people in the world. But yeah. what was mind boggling and the quickest way to make anyone look like a chump, chump, chomp. Anyway, uh, hypercars come through. You know, a few people went wide. You get down at LMP2 again. Get to the GT class. You know, you got Vantages. You got 48s. What are 48s doing? Still racing in yeah. WEC, by the way. It's got, it's got to be 2960 soon, surely. Honestly, they look like the most awkward gentleman race. They all binned it. Everyone crashed. There were 911s in the gravel. There were people touching each other. Like, none of them could make it through they, the corner. They, they, were the, they weren't the pros. Uh, what, it confused me out. I don't, I think it's just GTAM, isn't it? Is there a pro? So, what, I get so it, confused by it, the new... Is it the pro-ams or just the amateurs? Is that. there pro-ams? I don't but know. But, but, they're, but they're similar. Whoever pro- they were, mate. They looked useless. A, a pro am is just a quick am, basically. It's not a pro. So let's look at the um, the categories. But as I say, it, it doesn't really matter because I'm sure some of them were super legit racing drivers. In these conditions, they all look like complete novices. Yeah, fair and enough. the mind-boggling thing is once they did get up to speed, these hypercars, mate, They're they so fast, aren't they? Fly. Yeah. And you could literally sit in, and you could see it. So they wouldn't be far from an F1 car then. Yeah, not that far. Not I mean, that you far. know, but anyway, so they're flying and loads of grip and they would come through Lacoum and they were tentative, but they were fast. By the time you get to the GT cars, literally like they're braking so far in advance yeah. and they're sitting through the corners, waiting, waiting, and then yeah. just tend to look. Yeah. Like trying to put the power down and it yeah. just not working. Yeah. Um, it was really, really cool to see. Um, okay, WEC family classes. So we've got the hypercar class, LMP2, and then L M G T E A M. Well, AM means AM. So the GTAM category came into being in 2011 and includes road racing cars derived from street models. Category includes professionals and amateur driver lineups. Wow. So that's their new the new category, L M G T A M. But yeah, really, really cool to see. Made me very excited for Le Mans. Um loud as hell, the Cadillac hypercar is the loudest thing I've heard in my life. Is it? Like, <laughs> no, that is so cool. Um but yeah, like proper racing, you yeah, know what fair. I mean? Proper racing, proper skill. Yeah. And a category which maybe has been a little bit in the doldrums for a few years with Toyota's cleaning up. And they're still cleaning up because they've got a march on everyone. But you've got recognizable teams, cool. Like it's it's very, and everyone that went was like, that was very cool to see. Um, so I, I highly recommend trying to get down to a WEC race. It's weird as, as well because it's got, it has its own um, weather 
climate, mm-hmm. the, microclimate, microclimate. Yeah. yeah, yeah, similar to Nurburgring, but, but Spa is like terrible for it. Well, you know, always wet and raining. Basically. Yeah, literally. Yeah, makes it dramatic though. <laughs> makes it super dramatic. But yeah, I mean, do would you care? Would you support a team if you went to WEC, or you wouldn't care? No, you just watch the action. Yeah. I was behind Ferrari. I couldn't help but was not. you? Yeah. Oh yeah, I probably would look look I wouldn't support the team. Gr- I just want to see the racing. Great. They look yeah. super cool. Yeah. Was there any Porsches there? Yeah, but they didn't do, they're not doing they're not doing that well. No GT threes. Any GT threes? Oh yeah, then the GT stuff, but there's Porsche hypercars, bro. Right. Porsche in the hypercar class. And that, there's the single one and there's Porsche they're, themselves. They're, they always used to be the quickest, the Porsche. Yeah, they're not they're used not to be doing, since they've come back, they're not doing great. Wow. I, I think they're doing quite well in IMSA. The American yeah. Endurance Championship, right. um, but in WEC so far, maybe I'm wrong. I think they have stolen the old podium by mistake, but but just on pure pace, they're not really there. Right. It seems to be Toyota, Ferrari, and Cadillac, and then Porsche. Right, which isn't great. Not really, yeah, because they're normally good. Well, imminently, we've got 100 years of Le Mans and 75 years of Porsche all at the same weekend. Oh dear. So I'm assuming they want to do something. Good for that. If they're not got a fast car. Why don't they won't yeah. do anything? Did you know that there's the big unveiling that weekend? No. What unveiling? <gasps> what? Now, we'll touch on this. This will finish out our episode. If we're talking about our love of GT3s and our amazing week, we can talk about potentially a new Porsche coming that we're going to want. So, uh, can I say that? Yeah, I'm going to say it. I've been invited to an event in Stuttgart, not in Stuttgart, but in Germany, June 8th or 9th for the celebration of 75 years of Porsche and the unveiling of a special model. A new hybrid car. And it's all been rumoured and spoken about. Lots of dealers have now been notified. Lots of big collectors have been notified. I can't remember if it's the 8th or the 9th. It's the same date that the first ever Porsche 356 rolled off the production line stamped as a Porsche. And obviously a few days before Le Mans, which is the 100 years of Le Mans. And obviously Porsche winning, et cetera, et cetera. So... The obvious answer is it's the ST, the long rumored ST, which is essentially a 911R, a street going GT3 RS. That's the obvious answer. But rumors are now going sort of crazy with the thought that could it be something more special than that? Is an ST special enough? Given the significance of all of these different anniversaries coming together, could we be seeing the start of yes, the 918 successor? The next well, hypercar from Porsche, that which, car. yeah, a that lot of people due. say, be, and, and, you know, again, people have been kind of rumouring for a while with all those Porsche design concepts that came out weirdly. When was that? 18 months or two years ago? Why did that happen? Was it so that they could gauge interest from customers? Who knows? And what about that test mule that's going around Nürburgring, which is a GT3 RS body? It's got a turbo engine in it. Well, and it's got turbo inlets, doesn't yes. it? It has the turbo inlets. So, yeah, theoretically a 2RS coming, maybe. But that's early. Very it early. It's usually yeah. the ten point years. two. It's usually the generation. So yeah. there's something going on and there's something coming. Mm. It's either going to be uber exciting or a little bit disappointing. Okay. <laughs> um, but they're, they're building up to something. So yeah, that weekend should be quite an exciting weekend one way or another. Interesting. Watch this space. Watch this space. Get your deposit down now. Uh, anyway, so we're going to wrap things up for this episode. As I say, brought to you from our very glamorous hotel room in Spain. I say, ah, it's not our hotel room. We're not sure. Tony's got a room on a different floor. Um, but we're I have literally got it on a different floor. And, yeah. and it's a suite. No, it won't surprise me. <laughs> I'm in the cheapest room available and he's in the suite. And we're now going to go for a very nice dinner, which he's going to refuse to pay for. But no. that uh, sums up our friendship. Um, but yeah, hopefully, we, uh, hopefully you enjoyed the episode. Um, we're going to be recording another episode, actually, a, a, a sort of bonus episode. I'm not entirely sure when that's going to be going out. It may be next week, um, but we'll just have to wait and see because we're trying to work out our future plans. But there mm-hmm. is a big Q&A episode coming soon, so stay tuned for that. Uh, obviously, if you want to check out After the Chicken Flag, my special series with Paul Wallace, that's available over on recast.tv for slash behind the glass. Uh, in the meantime, if you want to follow Tony and see what he's up to whilst we're away or whilst I'm away, he's at Tony Grawood Car Sales on most social media platforms. And for all my adventures, I'm at Seen Through glass so yes we'll be back with you next week either for another episode from this hotel room or potentially an episode from monaco we are so international i can't bear it (laughs) see you soon bye-bye see ya